in a previous video, I was talking about the early spatial impression, the term introduced by David Gressinger. I was talking about uh, how early part of the impulse response of enclosed space is mostly about affecting the sound image of a sound source and that the late part of it is more about building the image of space and I introduced a reflector uh, which is uh, several uh, delay end taps every one of which can go through a different type of filtering uh, usually when we mm, want just to model early reflections it's all about losing the high frequencies yeah, and it's uh, it can be just a one pole filter and I went even further and discussed kind of a hybrid of uh, spatial processing and a queuing which would include uh, bandpass filters on every delay and tap which can be very much useful in the uh, context of uh, mixing and uh, shaping the image of sound source maybe in a not that much a natural way but still naturalistic still naturalistic approach now here I'd like to discuss uh, one of the approaches to generate an image of, a, of space through the convolution which is in turn a way to realize a finite impulse response filtering for that we can just generate an impulse response using uh, different kinds of noises this noise then has to follow the principles of how the natural impulse response forms in time in a stereo configuration we should have uh, actually two impulse responses yeah and the key requirement here is that the impulse responses should be decorrelated and the second one is that they usually have a quasi exponential decay another requirement for the impulse response is that the echo density in a natural space builds up with uh, with time yeah it's not instant so just inserting the white noise is not enough it can be a very useful thing on its own but not to realistically model the impulse response of an enclosed space so here are the several examples of this type of noises which we can then uh, convolve with the input signal to get the actual reverberation the first example is a white noise so what I do I on every iteration for the resulting impulse response and the size of the impulse response is presented by n which in this case is two seconds here yeah, with the sampling rate of 44.1 kilohertz uh, on every iteration I choose between zero zero and the uh, random value from minus five minus 0.5 to 0.5 yeah and I do that probabilistically uh, with the probability uh, for the noise values increasing towards the end of the impulse response yeah so it it grows linearly here the p-value is normalized to the size of the whole array and so this way I can simulate the growth of the echo density yeah we can also use something like uh, some tree rant which is uh, one of the cheap ways to generate uh, Gaussian noise or velvet noise which is the uh, same values with the random sign this impulse response then has to be filtered or other ways we will have a lot of high frequency reverberation usually that's not the thing that uh, that happens in a real uh, in real space this can be done with a one pole filter one pole filter uh, works beautifully usually for this type of tasks uh, so here is a formula that can be used to filter an impulse response 
this is almost same as uh, the one pole filter we have in a super collider. The only difference is that in super collider, as you might see, the coefficient. Oh, okay. The block diagram. What 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 is the one pole filter? It's a recursive filter, which has uh, every next value as a sum of the current input value and a previous output value. Yeah, and they are uh, multiplied by a coefficient. I mean, both the input value and the output values uh, value are multiplied by the same coefficient. The difference is that the input is multiplied by 1 minus coefficient and coefficient itself is between 0 and 1. A and the output, previous output value is multiplied just by, by this coefficient. Yeah. And the super collider version, super collider version has this coefficient um, calculated as an absolute value. Why is it here? It allows you to go to the negative values of coefficient. Yeah. So here it will be negative, by, but here it will stay positive and this will result in a high pass filter yeah we don't need it here so in, in in the formula that I use here I don't have it here okay so I formed the first previous value which is uh, just an input first input value and then I go through a, a recursive procedure where on every next iteration I take that previous value yet yeah, on the first like on the first iteration of this collect loop, I take this one uh, and take the next one from the array and do the same thing. And so I do that again and again. Um, and this results in filtering. But the good thing is to not just filter them um, uh, this way statically, the dynamic filtering would be even better. For that, we have to introduce something to this formula which is this coefficient should uh, grow with time, yeah? So this formula oh, is the actual that I usually use. I provide the starting coefficient and then I uh, modify this coefficient with, uh, with time, yeah? Because actually the index represents time in this case. And the coefficient, as you can see, grows at every iteration is also normalized to the range that we have. Let's say we start with 0.4, yeah? And we want to end up with one, yeah? Uh, for that, we have to normalize this coefficient uh, value, that it is the, the part that we add on every iteration with this um, one minus start coefficient. And then if I want this coefficient to grow faster or maybe slower, I can use the old trick with uh, power. I name it old trick because I already uh, showed it in the several videos. I use it on a server side usually uh, to modify envelopes in most cases. By the way, it can also be used to wave shape the sound. Uh, but we are not about that now. So that's it. The, the power method is a good one to bend the the curve yeah it it would be a linear growth without it with it it can go like this or like this if the coefficient is less than one this power value sorry power value is less than one this absorption curve parameter then it will grow like that yeah like that if it's more than one it will grow like this, but actually less than one is the most applicable thing if you want just it to, to grow faster. So I do the actual filtering here. And the next thing is this envelope that discretize. This, by the way, also is a way to create dynamic uh, values like here. Yeah, I could replace this line, for example, with the index indexing into an array of coefficients. Yeah, and array would be formed like this. So this is an env, uh, the same env that we use in synth devs. And probably you know all that. Then by using this discretize uh, method, I can discretize the envelope, like turn it into an array of n elements. The remaining part is just same as in a partitioned convolution 
uh, help file. I just put it here and uh, it requires you to create additional buffers. Then you can remove them. I do it here. And you end up with uh, two buffers with your impulse responses inside. What's next? Let's take a listen on how these impulse responses sound. I would, uh, yeah, use uh, just an impulse as an input signal. Let's only listen to the convolver output. This is a white noise with dynamic filtering. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's, for the comparison, take a look at the uh, static filtering. You see? Not a big difference, but there is a difference, yeah. So this one is without dynamic filtering. And here is the one that I personally prefer. Yeah. That's how it usually happens in real spaces. Not quite like that, of course, but the principle is closer. And let's take a look at what happens if we don't filter the white noise. Uh, no filtering at all. No filtering? No, 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 I didn't remove this. No filtering, yeah. No. Too much high frequencies. <clears throat> now let's take a look at uh, Gaussian noise. It's a bit, uh, a bit quieter. Let's make it louder. Yeah. It's a bit, it's a more gentle sound, uh, not that busy in low mid frequencies. And the velvet noise, it's the loudest one because we all always uh, keep the the same values, just change the sign. Yeah, but the sound is rather smooth. Yeah, sound is rather smooth. Let's now also add the reflector. Let's take this, by the way, let's take this uh, Gaussian noise. And include the reflector. And include the reflector. So here we have direct signal, direct sound. Then after that, we have uh, 20 milliseconds uh, initial time delay gap here, the pre-delay, and then early reflections. As we can see, they are low pass filtered here. Um, uh, these ones are separately controlled, yeah? We can play with the amplitude of this part, of course, of this part, and this is the late part uh, generated by the, con by the convolution of the impulse with the uh, with the generated impulse response. Well, basically, that's the impulse response itself, yeah. That's what we generated on the SC-Lang side. Uh, yeah, let's... Let me, yeah, I can do it like this, yeah. Oh, yeah. So here, as we can see, we have... They are filtered as well. As well as we can see that the density of the impulses, of the reflections, yeah modeled reflections is increasing with time. After looking at it, let's take a listen uh, with the anechoic orchestral recording. So this is the mono recording of an orchestra in an anechoic place, an anechoic room. Let's take a listen.
The dry signal. This is the dry signal. The original one. These are the early reflections. A little bit on the left. Okay. <clears throat> and the tail. And now all of them. Dry plus early and then the tail. Okay. Mixing uh, the 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 reverberational signals in headphones is not a good idea usually. Well, can can be done, but always requires some training and, and comparison to some reference because otherwise you may end up with too dry or too wet not that easy to get like what's going on i mean it seems okay but when you listen through the head to the loudspeakers after a while it looks in my case usually too dry let's compare different noises different impulse responses this was a gaussian let's now take a white noise This one is a bit louder than the previous one, yeah? Again, the Gaussian. Yeah, Gaussian. Is it Gaussian in English? It's Gauss in Russian, yeah? Gauss. Gauss, sorry, the Gaussian. Okay. I would make it a little louder. something like that in my headphones now let's take check the velvet one it should be the loudest one dry signal, very reflections. Velvet one sounds nice, but a bit artificial to my taste, but nevertheless, it's nice. It's nice, it has its own mm, kind of aesthetic aesthetic value. It, uh, there is an aesthetic value to it, and it's meaningful, but but a little, but a little uh, uh, artificial. Like, it sounds like something synthesized. What should I mention here? The delay compensation. Uh, like every FFT, uh, FFT unit generator in Super Collider uh, has, a, has a delay equal to the FFT size, which is an uh, argument to FFT unit generators, yeah, uh, minus the control block. And uh, in my case, the block size is, the, is 64. 64. 64 samples <clears throat> in case of partitioned convolution we have uh, 
f of t size as twice the actual delay size yeah well if i'm not mistaken it takes f of t size as the full size of the FFT procedure output, yeah? Usually only half is taken, half is mirrored, the, the negative one. One additional thing that I would add to this construction is I would also uh, add a, a Wample filter that would filter the sound that goes into the convolver. Sorry, not here. Here. I would add one pole filter that would filter this signal. Why? Because sometimes, since I actually feed the input, not the reflections here, yeah? Um, <clears throat> sometimes I would like it to be even duller. I would like to, some, to have some dynamic control. So I would filter this as well, just in case it's needed. Probably in most cases it wouldn't be needed, but I'd like to have it here because it's cheap um, and allows me some, to do some adjustments. Uh, of course, I could also use early reflections and set them here, would probably in some cases play nice, but sometimes it might cause uh, some phasing effects, which maybe would be not that desirable. Anyways, like if you want the cleanest result, you send the, the direct signal to the convolver. But maybe sometimes you would like to uh, uh, have a... Uh, uh, flexibility of uh, overall control and some integrity uh, so you would uh, uh, send uh, early reflections to a convolver yeah maybe even have some kind of a mix between what goes to the convolution uh, the input or early reflections or some mix between them okay so let's also try the previous synthetic example and see how this works for the synthesized sounds. This is the same as in the previous video, just a very simple FM synthesizer uh, with the reflector as well as in the previous uh, example. But now we don't have a bandpass filters in the reflector here, only one pole filters just to tame high, fre high frequencies. And uh, what do we have here? I have, and this is important thing I would, I'd like to uh, address here. The whole um, organization, how I see it with uh, this type of convolution, and by this type, I mean the stereo convolution. I have two impulse responses and uh, I convolve the left and right signals of the input, be it just a, uh, original dry signal or a mix with early reflections, I convolve correspondingly, left with left, right with right. <clears throat> what that gives me, since the two impulse responses are decorrelated, it's a kind of opening or enlightening different parts of the space. Yeah, like imagine we, we, we have a, what is that, torch here or something, uh, some light source. Uh, and we point to different parts of the dark room, yeah. And so by that, by pointing the torch, we we see like what's actually there, like. Uh, and this is a good reference, visual reference to what goes on with when, when we convolve the stereo impulse responses with stereo sound sources. So if the sound source is on the left, for example it will we will see more the convolution with the left uh, part of the whole uh, sound image of space uh, if it's on the right and so on yeah so what I would propose following the original idea of uh, early part of the impulse response goes as a, a sound source shaper and uh, the later part represents the sound image of space itself. Uh, so the good organization would be just have one convolver to represent the space and uh, send signals to that convolver, stereo signals to that convolver, and uh, have the reflectors inside of the source, sound source in depths. Yeah. 
which would uh, correspondingly shape the sound sources themselves. Yeah. So this was already in a previous example, example for the previous video, uh, which includes the simple uh, FM synthesizer and the reflector inside the same synthesis node. Yeah. From this here, from this, I now send the, uh, what do I send? Yeah, here. I send to the effect bus, the certain bus that I will specify here. Oh, sorry, what, what, why? Ah, okay. Yeah, that I specify here. I would send the signal to the uh, convolver. Yeah. And now convolver has that one pole filter as I mentioned before, and other than that there is nothing to talk about, I only, yeah, I delay, of course, I didn't mention about that before, yeah, here, yeah, I didn't mention, I delay the convolved signal, of course, by 50 milliseconds, yeah, obvious thing to do, obvious thing to do, obvious thing to do, so, let's check it, it it's now with the velvet noise, yeah, Let's check how it sounds with the velvet noise. So... Without the space. <laughs> velvet noise is the loudest one. The Gaussian noise. The quietest one. Let's try the white noise. Yeah, something like this seems good. <coughs> Let's, by the way, make a bigger impulse response. Here's five second Gaussian noise.
let's check out how it sounds with the direct sound and the convolver this one is nice I like this one James Moore should be mentioned, of course, he was one of the first uh, researchers to mention this method. Uh, the method is not only about the convolution of uh, white noise uh, with, the, with the sound source to uh, generate late reverberational tail. The reflector idea itself is also, uh, was also described by him. So he was one of the first people to introduce these structures in the computer music. Uh, to resume on this uh, convolution method, uh, first, um, like one of the good sides that convolutional method has is uh, it almost never will sound metallic. The metallic quality that we all always that is always easy to get with uh, uh, recursive filter-based reverberation uh, isn't here, yeah, it's very rare here. We have also very detailed control, yeah, because we can synthesize the impulse response and this will, this allows us to be very, very precise with what we want to be there, what not, and so on. We can take the original impulse responses of some spaces, yeah, and create uh, versions of it, yeah, by modifying them, loading them into an array, and then adding something, removing something, and so on. We can even uh, go further than stereo and make uh, binaural impulse responses, for example, by convolving every uh, tap in our impulse responses with uh, head-related transfer functions, then we will get the three-dimensional ones. Um, and so on. So very detailed control. Uh, the the programs that acousticians use to model spaces to be built, yeah, so-called auralization process, uh, usually construct impulse responses from the CAD-like software, which then are uh, convolved with HRTFs, and so we can take a listen how it sounds for a certain sound source at the certain point in that virtual room. And the last, the, the, the last thing to mention is that, of course, like this, how we have it here, yeah, the partitioned convolution way, um, it's static. What we usually face with the reverberators when we mix something, for example, uh, is you always have to render before you start actual mixing, final step in mixing. You have to render first all the tracks with the reverberation and all that before you start to, you want to go further. Why? Because if it has a modulating uh, signals in it, and usually reverberators, like recursive filter-based reverberators, have uh, modulating filters inside. And in some cases, these are um, the coefficients modulated by the low frequency noises, yeah, and so it's not synchronized to a timeline and uh, not probably controlled by any seed numbers or so, so or something like that. So every time you press play, you get different sound actually. So you have to render that, like print to a separate track before you go further to mix them. With convolution, this is not that of a big problem, yeah. 
even though yeah it depends a little from which point you start to listen and still it's good to render everything if you're a perfectionist yeah but it allows much more control but the downside of it is just sometimes this static decay sounds a little uh, monotonic probably so okay uh, that's it about the convolution part uh, the next video will be about the recursive filter based uh, reverberation the tail synthesis reverberation and tail reverberational tail synthesis that's so difficult to pronounce <coughs> a reverberational tail a reverberational a reverberational tail okay